Menschen Auto war. Tonight we usher in the new year, celebrate the creation of the world. We close one chapter on the book of life and begin to write new headings, prepare for new experiences, take account of where we have been and where we hope to be. In these holy moments, I'd like to share with you a prayer written by Rabbi Sidney Greenberg. This night, as the new year begins, we come together as a community, yet each of us is strangely solitary. Each of us comes here with special hopes and dreams. Each of us bears our own worries and concerns. Each of us has a story no one else can tell. Each of us brings praise no one else can offer. Each of us feels joy no one else can share. Each of us has regrets that others cannot know. And so at this sacred time, we pray. If we are weary, may we find strength. If we are discouraged, may we find hope. If we are forgotten how to share, may we teach each other and learn together. If we have been careless with one another, may we seek forgiveness. If our hearts have been chilled by indifference, May we be warmed by renewed purpose, inspired by the spirit of this holy night. I've returned to this prayer many times over the last few weeks in anticipation of a Rosh Hashanah that would look and feel different than any before. Many of these lines speak deeply and directly to our souls, though certain words seem to jump off the page if we have forgotten how to share, may we teach each other and learn together. Ultimately, this is what I'd like to speak with you tonight. Unfortunately, it seems our society has lost a fundamental feature, the ability to trust, the ability to share. We no longer trust our news sources, our political systems. We no longer trust large sections of the public to act in accordance with health protocols. And perhaps most troubling, we no longer fully know how to share, how to share space, how to share opinions, how to share truth. And increasingly, we have an incredible amount of difficulty speaking with people with whom we disagree. I include myself in this societal problem. During the month of Elul, As I try to spend a little time each day working on myself, I recognized a bit of a pattern in my own behavior. I was able to create positive interactions with people whom I related to and I agreed with. And with those I disagreed with, there was tension and distance and sometimes, yes, even conflict. While I don't exactly feel uh, great about that self-discovery, I do not believe that it is unique to my experience. Amongst the many existential crises of our day, certainly one of the most challenging to overcome is this absurd polarization. We find ourselves in shock and dismay at the choices and opinions of others, unable to understand them, unable to empathize. And this division, I believe, is caused by what the author Tom Nichols calls the death of the expertise. One of the most dangerous ideas that has come about in the last three or four years is that all points of view are equally valid and that every average citizen is just as equipped to judge which has merit and which do not for themselves. The idea that I will hear all sides and judge for myself. No, we cannot condone the death of expertise. And in an age where anyone can instantly publish opinions online, communicate to mass audiences, we must pause and recognize that this is a spiraling staircase that we do not want to walk down. Now, I am the first to admit that I am an expert in very, very few things, if anything. 
But in those areas, I trust in my studies, I trust in my hard work, I trust in my experience. And just because I have the capacity to understand complex problems in various other fields, my opinion is not as valid as the experts in those fields. It's just, it just is not. That is why they are the experts. So if our leading epidemiologists largely agree that A is correct, and a couple of discredited doctors make a video that says B is correct, our response should not be, well, I'll listen to both of them and decide which makes the most sense to me. That is outrageously dangerous. Confirmation bias exists, and none of us are free from it. Genuinely smart people look for answers from people who are smarter than themselves. And only ignorant people believe that their guess is as good as anyone else's. Now, you may be saying, take it easy, Rabbi Goodman. No need to get so worked up on Rosh Hashanah. But don't you feel this anger too? Are you not here with me? It is frustrating beyond words. As COVID numbers continue to rise, I feel closer to a breakdown right now than I did a year ago. And it's not from fear of being sick or getting sick, but perhaps because we have the tools to fight this pandemic, and there are some who simply choose to not take them up. It's one thing to watch the world burn. It's another thing to watch the world burn while we're holding a turned off hose. So yes, I find it impossibly challenging to sit down and talk with people who hold certain opposing worldviews. And in a time of extreme polarization, we simply may never see eye to eye with a large segment of our society. And that feels terrifying. What is amazing about this moment of separation and polarity is that while society at large continues to be divided, Scientists and rabbinic organizations have never been more unified. A highly regarded epidemiologist and observant Jew recently de delivered a powerful sermon at his home congregation about the current pandemic and the necessity for vaccination. Though he has asked his friends and his colleagues not to attribute these words directly to him, for he has been receiving threats for sharing his expert opinion at his home shul. How shameful is that? It is exactly the problem. Individuals with no medical background are raging against a man who is providing expertise in a field for which he holds the highest academic honors and over 30 years of experience. He writes, every reputable public health scientist and epidemiologist is in agreement every single one. TV news shows and podcasts presenting so-called debates about both sides are simply clickbait. There are no competing opinions about the necessity of immunization within public health and epidemiology. This is without, expect without exception. And even more remarkable is the rabbinic rulings of world Jewry. Every major Jewish movement has its paskim, or rabbinic decisors, who issue teshuvot, response to literature, answering questions of the era, drawing on the wisdom of our rabbinic sages and on contemporary understandings of the world. And throughout history, some of our greatest rabbis themselves have been doctors, starting with Rambam and Ramban and Sforno, so what do our modern rabbis have to say? As with pu public health scientists, rabbinic opinion on the imperative of vaccination is unanimous. I, I cannot overstate what an incredible statement that is. Since when do rabbis agree on anything? Further, this is not just an endorsement, a recommendation, but required as a mitzvah a condition of Jewish observance. And a mitzvah, to be clear, does not simply mean a good deed, as so many believe. 
but rather a positive commandment, a Torahic, a rabbinic, thou shall. In the case of the present vaccine, our poskim are unanimous. These include rabbis of the conservative movements, uh, rabbinical assembly, the rabbinical council of America, the Orthodox Union, the Haredi movements, Agudath Yisrael of America, the Reconstructionist Rabbinical Association, the chief rabbi of Israel, who even suspended a judge from the Beit Din for not being vaccinated. Chabad, which fired an emissary for speaking out against vaccination and then shut down his center. The chief rabbi of United Hebrew Congregations of the Commonwealth. And of course, the Reform Movement's Central Conference of American Rabbis. Every single one rules in favor of vaccination. Now, I wanted to give another COVID-19 sermon probably as bad as you wanted to hear one. But as we all know, we are not out of the woods. All epidemiologic and public health authorities, all rabbinic councils of the world, and every branch of Judaism are speaking here with one voice. And so we must listen to our experts. Now, I imagine that perhaps I may have offended a few folks, and for that I do apologize. I want to be incredibly clear. I do not think that being opposed to vaccination makes you a bad person. I do believe, however, that you have been misinformed. Something I have heard a lot in this debate, if you'd like to call it a debate, is that if you would like to, if, if we should feel free to resist calls to be vaccinated, that we should resist government mandates of any kind because it is solely our decision to make and no one else's. And as a general philosophy of life, it's hard to argue with the idea that it is my body and it is my choice. And if one is of a more libertarian leaning when concerning issues related to social policies, political economy, okay. Maybe there is some merit there. But let us not mix apples and oranges. In reference to our health and to the health of our communities, the position is actually entirely contrary to the Jewish law. In Judaism, we have no right to put either our own well-being or other people at risk. The very basis of our medical morality is communal not individualistic. Each of us is called upon to be an agent of healing for others. And thus, the worst thing that we could do is act in a way that would jeopardize the health of someone else. If we are physiologically able to receive this vaccine and choose not to, we are not simply exercising a personal choice. We are in active rebellion against the foundational principles of Jewish life. Let's take this one final step further. Jewish medical ethics not only requires us to be vaccinated, but it also lifts up the voice of the expert. Within the Talmudic structure, there is a classification of a certain type of person known as the Baki a medical expert. Tractate Yoma, which deals with the halakha and the rituals of Yom Kippur, explains that a baki must be consulted when making a decision whether or not an ill person should eat or fast on the holiest of days. We need not go into the very details of what the baki rules and how they interact with the rabbis, Rather, the very fact that the classification of Baki exists is a lesson for our age. The Shulchan Aruch, the most accepted Jewish legal code in existence, claims the Torah has granted the physician to heal. It is a religious duty which comes under the rule of Pekuach Nefesh, saving an endangered life. If the doctor withholds treatment, it is akin to bloodshed. And it goes on to say, 
Nevertheless, one should not occupy themselves with medical treatment unless they are Baki, an expert, and that there is none greater than they. Rabbi David Bloom teaches on this source that here we see a recognition that there are regular people like you and me, there are experts, and then there are experts among experts. And our society cannot afford to throw these opinions to the wayside. This is the time of year when we contemplate the meaning of the Book of Life. Rabbi Maurice Davis teaches that for many of us, the Book of Life has been reduced to words of casual welcome, spoken, written on cards, l'shana tova tikatevu, may you be inscribed for a good year. But what exactly is the Book of Life? Rabbi Davis writes, when I hear those words, they have meaning. I do not see a ledger in the skies wherein my fate is written, signed, and sealed, nor do I see some greeting card with the bottom line appearing the words Lashana Tova Tikatevu. The Book of Life is a symbol. It says to me, you are recorded. What you say is more than words whispered into the wind. What you are is something more than pebbles on the beach. What you do has an effect. On Rosh Hashanah, we recognize the beauty and the brokenness of our world. When frustrated, angry, or hurt, sometimes we narrow in on the words and opinions of others, feeling an adrenaline-like urge to fight or flight, insulting or distancing, ridiculing, or with a sense of self-righteousness, removing individuals entirely from our lives. Certainly, we are all entitled to our opinions. But let us learn how to weigh the importance of our opinions and those of the experts in our midst. Our Jewish tradition values a multitude of voices. This is why the Talmud includes the teachings of both the accepted and minority opinions. However, as we learn from that multitude, let us recognize that it matters significantly both what is being said and who is saying it. As Rabbi Greenberg prayed, if we have forgotten how to share, may we teach each other and learn together. If we have been careless with one another, may we seek forgiveness. If our hearts have been chilled by indifference, may we be warmed by renewed purpose, inspired by the spirit of this holy night. Ken Yehiratzon, Leshenatova.